right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our talk. We're going to be talking about infrastructure as code and modern data resilience on AWS. I am Stephen Manley, the CTO at Druva, and I am joined by Richard Boyd. My name's Richard Boyd. I'm a developer advocate covering developer tools at AWS. So I cover our um, SDKs, a CDK, or CLI, uh, the code suite, uh, code build, code pipeline, et cetera, as well as our IDEs and our ID toolkits. So, so quick question before we get started. So how many of you in the audience are more on the developer side? You, you spend your time developing. All right, and then how many of the audience are more on maybe oversight, cloud operations, IT, infrastructure management? Okay, actually a pretty even split, that's good. Now, you know, one of the things that you'll see as we go through this talk is, is Richard represents a lot of the developer side, and I used to be a developer, but now I went over to the dark side, so I'm gonna be more on that management side. You can tell that's why we dressed the way we did. So, uh, just, to, just to kick off, just to give you a sense, you know, who's, who's Druva, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what are we about? Right, just to give you a little bit of context uh, of where we come from, because through a lot of this talk, we'll be certainly giving you best practices uh, from Richard's point of view, but then you know, sort of share how Druva has been doing it. Uh, so, so Druva is a, a data protection as a service company, uh, and you know, we're built entirely on AWS. We're built natively on AWS, uh, and we protect uh, upwards of a couple hundred petabytes of customers' data, over 3,500 customers around the world. Uh, we run around eight. 8 million backups a day, so that's over 2 billion backups uh, during the course of a year. So we run at a pretty large scale. And you know, in terms of how we've developed, in terms of the tooling we've used, in terms of the techniques we've used, again, you know, we're, we're going to share our experiences, what worked for us, what didn't work for us, uh, you know, what's, worked, uh, what's worked at scale, what had to change as we evolved. And, uh, and again, between Richard's experiences and ours, uh, hopefully we'll give you some, some tips and guidance to, to help you through. So, in terms of the context for today, so you know, we're going to first talk about the developer tooling, why it matters, again, some, some of the, the best practices there. Then we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about all right, how are you going to secure the data that's associated with these, uh, these IAC applications. And then with whatever time we have left, uh, Richard and I are going to wax eloquent about what's going to happen in the future. And because this is recorded, you'll be able to come back to us two years from now and say that literally everything we told you was wrong. So. Let's, uh, let, let's kick this off with some of the basics about developer tooling. So I will, there we go. Oh. Uh, so what we see, what I see when I talk to customers, uh, specifically in the CICD space for developer tooling, is that um, your CICD applications will produce kind of logs and data on their own, right? You run uh, unit tests, uh, those produce test results that you want to say because you want to see is my test coverage increasing over time or decreasing over time? In order to do that, you need to emit metrics about test coverage, you need to uh, aggregate them uh, and then store them over some period of time and then kind of examine them later. Um, so your CI, CD applications, I mean, that's just in the CD, CI space, um, with, is generating data that you need to store and likewise protect. The CD uh, category, you know, your pipelines will deploy your application. You want to keep track of how many uh, of our pipeline deployments have um, you know, needed to be rolled back? How many deployed without a problem? Uh, how long does it take to go from the first stage of my pipeline to fully deployed to production? So you need to store metadata around every stage of your CD pipeline. That's also data that you want to you know, protect and you want to store, be able to retrieve. Um, and then we talk about developer productivity. Developers will you know, take dependencies on open source projects because it does some very simple thing that they don't want to have to re-implement themselves. If you can take a dependency on a you know, MIT licensed uh, application, that's undifferentiated heavy lifting you don't have to do, um, but you also want to be able to make sure that the thing you're taking this dependency on is secure. Um, it has a permissive license, it's not, there's nothing untowards in it, um, and it does what it needs to, what it claims to do. And likewise with your testing and automation, I had previously mentioned kind of CI testing. Uh, when you deploy your application into, say, a pre-production environment, you might want to do, you know, use canary tests or other types of you know, load tests against that, you want, and that's generating data too. Uh, typically, people, people can use like real data in these tests to get like real results. Sometimes they'll use synthetic data, or what we call canary tests, um, but that's also data you want to protect. And each of these bits of data by themselves aren't necessarily 
uh, you know, sensitive or classified by any means. But if you aggregate a lot of these, you could have a situation where when all this data is taken together, it is much more sensitive than the individual portions of it, um, which is why you need you know, monitoring tools to again, keep an eye on what's going on and access patterns to your data. Uh, you want to keep an eye on like the health of your application. And all this is, comes back to it's you know, generating data as part of doing your regular develop tooling, developer tooling process. So, 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 Richard, I know, you know one of the things we face is Druvik, because again, we've got, we've got the CI CD pipeline. We, we, we basically redeploy in our world every two weeks, right? Every, everything redeploys in, in, in every two weeks. And, and obviously, we've got developers constantly pushing forward. One of the struggles I've got is, is just twofold. And I'm curious your thoughts on this. One is, you know, who's allowed to have access to what data? Because, like you said, you know, the more of it I aggregate, suddenly there could be interesting, sensitive things that, that, uh, that, that I don't want everyone to be able to get access to, especially if I'm using, you know, say, testing with maybe some customer based data that, that we've got. Um, so, so that's my first question is, I guess, what are some best practices you see people doing around uh, trying to make sure that only the right people can get access to the data, how long you're supposed to hold it? Are there, are there tools, techniques? What, what should I do to make sure that I don't get overrun with a whole bunch of, of basically, you know, sort of log data and, and infrastructure data? Yeah, so what, we've, um, what I've seen most frequently is uh, the central security team will say, well, tell me what data you need and justify it, and I'll give you access to that. And data scientists love this approach because they know exactly what data they're going to need before they even start doing their analysis. A data scientist, they say, well, just give me access to all of the data. I will build my model, and then I'll tell you what I need for the final model. And it it's, tends to be difficult for those two to come to an agreement on that. Um, and what, what I've seen and what happens most frequently is people create what are called like data enclaves, where they'll, take a, they'll carve out a portion of their production data, they'll put it in a very secure area, and they ask the data scientist to bring their workflow to that data enclave. So now you have a data scientist who's working in an area they don't really want to be doing the work in. They prefer their own developer machine or um, the tools that they have on their local machine. Um, so sometimes they will uh, take some shortcuts and copy the data locally, or they'll copy it off to another environment where they can do something a bit better. And like having the observability to see where this data is going and tracking it through their infrastructure ends up being a key problem that security has to face, even when they are trying to reach a compromise with how do we protect the data but also give the uh, end users the access that they need to do their job. Yeah, now, one of the things we do around that um, is, is because we, we ran into the, that exact same thing. Right? We had, we had our, our data scientists, and they said, you know, I, I, yeah, just, just let me run in the prod environment. Because in the prod environment, I have all the data I need. And, and of course, not shockingly, <laughs> after they got laughed out of the room, and then after they left, people laughed at them even more. Um, you know, it led to that second sort of discussion of, well, if we give them the enclave, we can't trust them. And so what we ended up having to do was basically build sort of anonymization tools that would, uh, that would be able to create sort of, hey, you can get this set of data in your environment. Um, now, now, the tension we've got now, of course, is like you said, the data scientist said, oh, but I need this other piece of data, which means now they're dependent on the security team to basically update those scripts to, to get around them. But, uh, but yeah, I, so, so it sounds like there's no easy answer. It's, it's going to be negotiation between the, between the two. That's right. Okay, so, so, so that, that, that's one that, uh, and again, again, the more you, you, you guys go through this. Now, we had another customer, it was, it, was, um, uh, it, it was interesting, that was actually using Druva, where they had a lot of CI, CD data, uh, but it was, it was spread across all their, all their different sites, manufacturing company. And so they had, I want to say, like 27 different sites in different regions of the world. And what they wanted to be able to do was bring that data in one central location so that they could uh, put it in something like SageMaker so they could analyze it also so they could hold it so that if five years down the road, if they had an issue, let's say, with uh, some particular product, what test did we run against it? What did the environment look like? Uh, are the other 26 manuf manufacturing facilities, are they going to exhibit these same problems? Uh, that sort of thing. And so, so they ended up bringing it into one central location uh, and then, again, putting it in the hands of, frankly, people like us, structure people to sort of manage it for them. So, so there's a lot of different ways that, that people track on that. Um, now, now, there's another one I wanted to poke you on, uh, because I think everybody now worries about sort of that, that supply, supply chain security, right? And, and so, so sort of what's, what's the best practice there around, I want to make sure, especially as I'm using you know, third-party containers, third-party code, you know, what do you recommend to people to make sure that you're not 
effectively bringing something into your environment that you deeply regret. Yeah, so there are tools that we offer, like Code Artifact, that address this strictly in the um, software package dependency space, um, where you can limit which upstream repositories you can pull from. Um, there are uh, partner available tools that will uh, you know, scan your repository to check for licenses. You, last thing you want to do is uh, inadvertently bring in a very restrictive non-permissive license. The next thing you know, you're in a protracted legal battle. Um, and also, you want the this observability associated with um, when, let's say, MITRE comes out with a new CVE for whatever piece of software, the CISO is going to want to know, like, are we running this? And if so, where is it at? And what's our plan to remove it? And without this observability, this monitoring capability for what you're running, it's a big question mark. So you have to do a lot of manual work to check, uh, you know, usually people start at the source repositories and they look through all the package.json or the requirements.txt files. Um, and then they iterate from there and they say, okay, well, we depended on it at one point, but it looks like we may have deployed a different version at some other point, but that deployment might not have reached all of the regions. And then just the answer to the CISO is just, we don't know. Um, which CISOs love hearing that. They love being told that we don't know what's running. Uh, so having this uh, centralized view of what are all of the versions, like an inventory basically, um, and a systems manager uh, has a, I forget the name, someone's gonna yell at me for not remembering the name, but there's a, uh, an offering within systems manager that will show you, um, you know, these are the versions of software that's running on your entire fleet as an inventory management capability. It, it, it. I, I, I got to say, I, I cannot stress enough how important this point is and how it's become so much more important. Uh, I'm, I, again, for those of you out there, um, I, I would say that uh, most of the customers I've met in the last couple of weeks, and, and even ourselves, you know, when you when you look at what's your priority for next year, um, it's security first, and then security second, and then just in case you weren't sure, it was security third as well. And and the same is true for us. And and, and to Richard's point. Our CSO basically says, look, I assume something bad is going to get into the environment. And we've got hundreds of developers, and as much as we watch our prod environment, as much as we try to watch you know, our, our developer environments, someone's going to bring something in. And, and, and maybe it wasn't even, you know, to, to, to Richard's point, maybe we didn't even know it was vulnerable at the time we were using it. That vulnerability gets posted later. Um, and and, and so, so his assumption is something bad's going to happen. We need to know exactly you know, who brought it in, where it's gotten to, what the exposure is. Because there's a huge difference between, OK, this is in you know, Jim's, Jim's production environment and is really just segmented to this one Kubernetes cluster, and we can manage that, versus this has actually gotten all the way to, to deployment, and now it's running in prod and we've got a much, much bigger problem on our hands and it's time to roll out the incident response team. And so, so you know, as, as any of you are going through this, you know, I can't stress how important it is to be tracking not just you know, sort of the data, your applications, but also tracking the provenance of, of where your, your external data sources are coming from because, like I said, even for us internally at Druva, it's job one, two, and three uh, for this coming year. Everything else falls, you know, pales in comparison to that. So, so, so I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to switch a little bit to, to talking about some of Druva's experiences and then, and then kind of get Richard's, uh, Richard's opinion on, on some of the choices we've made. Uh, so, so the first choice we made, and I mentioned, you know, we're a data protection company. So whether you've got laptops or, or you know, uh, uh, SaaS applications like Salesforce or you've got data center apps, VMs, databases, file servers, or, of course, you're, you're running stuff in AWS itself, we protect it. Uh, and we protect your data into the Druva account, right? So it's in a separate account, it's, it's managed by us, all, all encrypted, all, all that good stuff. Uh, and so you can see kind of the way we've architected is in 16 regions around the world, we have you know, sort of the data plane set up. Uh, and then in you know, only a couple of regions do we really run the configuration and management. And, and it's interesting because most of the customers I meet, they say, well, okay, you must be revving the config and management almost never because that's scary, whereas the data stuff, you must constantly be enhancing. And the truth is, it's reversed, right? We, we actually separated control and data, and because the data is the customer's data, we tend to actually do a lot more work on the control plane because, frankly, it, it's a lot less risky, it's a lot less dangerous. 
I'm curious. I mean, are, are we are we following best practices? Are we crazy town? How how do, how do you uh, see this? This is this does align with our best practice um, internally at Amazon. We do the something very similar where we explicitly separate control and data planes, um, and we have this kind of cardinal rule of don't don't touch more than one thing at a time. Now, whether that's regions, availability zones, or even you know control of data planes, um, because if you make a mistake and one thing goes down, typically services are resilient to to that and not cause cascading or total failure. It's when you start touching multiple things at a time is when you get multi-region outages. It's when you get, uh, you know, the system is down and you also can't bring it back up because um, you, know, you get these compounding failures. So we do that internally. So things like um, Route 53, um, which, have, which boasts a 100% um, uptime SLA for the data plane. So your Route 53 requests will always resolve. Um, but the control plane, we have a different SLA because it's a different service with different requirements. Um, and to the customers, that's generally transparent. But internally, those are separate teams doing separate work. So we do a lot of work to separate our control and data planes, and that is a best practice. And, and again, our, our advice to anybody on this is, is, again, the same thing we went through is, what's the thing that absolutely can't go down? So if you're Route 53, you've got to resolve. You know, if you're Druva, You've got to be able to back up and recover. And on the control plane, again, is it annoying if you couldn't, say, set up a new backup job or change the schedule? Sure. Is it the same as your backup failing? <laughs> no. It's, it, yeah, and so understand, understand exactly what. And then to, to Richard's second point, you know, don't, uh, don't, if, if you're going to go down this road of, of, of separating out, really honestly, truly separate it. Because the number of times that it has been so much easier to debug because you upgrade a region Oh, that went wrong. Okay, quick, let's roll that back. You know, everything else picks up, cares for it. Uh, you know, get out of that monolithic upgrade kind of mode because it's going to kill you. Um, all right, so the second one, second choice, and we, and we constantly go back and forth on this one, is what do we build natively versus where do we use an AWS service? So, for example, we have this, this massive deduplicated file system where we store the customer's data. And, and, and as you can see from the picture, we use Dynamo for, for basically all the metadata processing, the dedupe index and effectively sort of the, the metadata for the file system, and then the data goes to S3 and Glacier and Glacier Deep Archive. Now, there have been moments inside the company where people have said, well, I mean, Dynamo's great, but you know, it's, it's general. I bet we could make our own sort of metadata layer for Druva that was 5% better than what we get out of Dynamo. Why don't we do that? And the answer, of course, is, because we have better things to do with our time. Um, but, but I'm curious, Richard, I mean, as you meet people, that balance between use the AWS service versus go implement it yourself, how do you, how do you recommend people balance that? Yeah, that? That tension exists anywhere you have developers. Coming from a developer background myself, I mean, we've seen that, if you've seen on, um, on Hacker News when someone posted like their um, the person who made uh, box.com, Dropbox, um, they said, hey, here's this thing I built, there's all kinds of, software engineers or uh, engineers who said, well, I could build that in the weekend. Like, I, uh, and it reminds me of this quote where it's, uh, as developers, we don't build something because we think it's easy. We build it because at one point we thought it was easy and we started, and now we have to finish it. Um, so there's a lot of like mi misunderstanding about how complex something can be until you get into it. And we have a, um, uh, one of our dev tools heroes who works for Steady, one of our partners, that he has this, mental model for deciding when to build versus when to buy. And he says, um, so if it exists as a product, you just buy it. If it doesn't exist as a product, um, maybe you could re-examine your, um, your requirements and say maybe I, I don't quite need as many requirements to make a thing that exists as a product and then use that. And if both of those things aren't true, then you build it yourself. And this will also lead you to only build things yourself that differentiate you as a product. So you're not spending time and cycles and resources building things that other people can just buy off the shelf and they're out innovating you. And, and I think uh, w one of the other ones that we see all the time internally is when we hire new data scientists and, they're, and they come in and they're, they're, they're just full of fire and vinegar and they're like, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go build every, all the AI ML stuff natively. I'm like, or we could just use SageMaker. No, no, SageMaker, that's too easy. <laughs> you know what? We're looking for answers. We're not looking, you know, we're not a research company. And so, so over and over again, I think that, that, that balance that Richard strikes, there is so much good stuff in AWS for us. There's a whole bunch of areas where we differentiate, but again, you know, focus on where you can add value. And so, so now then I want to hit on the last one, which is 
uh, we, we constantly, as we develop new services, um, you know, there's that balance between, so when do you go, let's say, uh, containers versus you go Lambda, uh, especially, you know, you know we're, we tend to be starting cloud native, but I meet a lot of customers that are also, you know, taking a virtualized application and they're saying, so should I just lift and shift this and run it on EC2? Should I containerize it? Should I go Lambda? What, what's your view there? So yeah, we see this when, when people, they do want to do this modernization um, and they'll typically decide, okay, we're going we're gonna to use uh, serverless, right? We're going to use AWS Lambda. We're going to go entirely cloud native, entirely serverless. Or they'll say, you know, let's do containers. Containers feel enough like an EC2 instance or feel enough like a VM that it's not going to scare all of our developers and they'll you know, shut down for a week. Um, and the, the big tension is, when you're making this shift, like which of these two technologies do you, do you move to? And the good news is you don't have to just pick one. You can have workloads that are uh, much more efficient and effective on Lambda. You can have some that are more efficient and effective on containers and use them both um, inside of a much larger application as various services. And, and, and I'd say, you know, one, one of our differentiators, how we choose to do it, and this may change over time, but, but certainly one of the things we look at is is it processing a lot of data, and is it a long-running process? Now, I, I, I get Lambda, you know, they can run for 10 minutes now, and, and, and you can certainly allocate more memory, and you can, you, you can get more storage associated with them. But we found it's still way more cost-effective to stay containerized for, for those sorts of things, whereas, whereas again, sort of the, um, you know, the, the jobs that we do, let's say, uh, creating AWS snapshots, right? So we do a lot of that for our customers. We'll, we'll create and manage AWS snapshots in their account. Well, that's all Lambda, right? Because it's, it's not processing the data, it's just triggering an, it's triggering an API. Or when we do, say, searches uh, for, for e-discovery, again, that tends to be more of a Lambda function for us. On the other hand, if you're running a restore of a virtual machine, yeah, we're gonna put that through container, because frankly, spinning up a whole bunch of Lambdas for each little chunk doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So. Yeah, to totally agree on, on both of those. Now, what I will also say is, as you go into each environment, you know, make sure that you're, you're ready for both. If you have one developer that just wants to use Lambda, that can be tricky, because there are a lot of different behaviors in Lambda. You know, how are you gonna do queuing? How are you going to, to manage the logs? You know, how are you gonna deal with external storage? All those sorts of things. So, so our recommendation on that is, you know, go to, go to Lambda if you've got enough people you know, to, to put some weight behind it. But if it's a one-off, you might still be better off just staying containers. So then, just, just to, to close on this first part of the talk, so we wanted to, again, just, just sum up some of the benefits of the infrastructure before then we go into, you know, what are you going to do about your data? So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Richard sort of take, a, take it away here. Yeah, so when we talk about why would someone want infrastructure as code, um, Ben Kehoe, another one of our heroes, um, he talks about... If you have a resource, it's best to have less than five or more than 50 of something. Because if you have less than five, you can easily, you know, if you need to do some work on all of them, you can do it manually. It might take you a day, it might not be very comfortable, but you can do it. If you have more than 50, you have enough of them to justify building the automation to making it automated. Where you get into trouble is where you have like 13 of something, where it's gonna take several weeks to do, but it's not quite enough to justify automating it. Um, so your options are, do I want just a few of something, or do I want many of it? Um, and, and then we start talking about you know test-driven development and you know disaster recovery. Um, if you're using infrastructure as code, you can uh, you're def you've defined your application as as this code that you can very easily deploy to new environments. So if something happens in in a particular data center or availability zone, you can easily deploy your stack to another availability zone, another region, and be back up online very quickly, as opposed to you know clicking around through the console, um, dealing with console updates that, that happen fairly frequently. Um, so what this ends up leading to is that um, you're going to want you know, in the sorry, the decision between you know five or fifty, you're going to end up on something more than fifty. It's it's much safer to have many very a lot of very small things than kind of one big one, right? We have this parable about or. Idiom is that what it is? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. I'm not sure what the exactly. Idiom. I think it, it, idiom probably. It's very similar to that. Like you don't want to put all your resources into one area, into one whether that's an AWS account, a region, a um, you know a data center, or a server. Um, you want to you know kind of spread these things out because it's easier. Um, it makes the system more resilient. And and and, and, and the one the one that I, I wanted to because all of that is true, right? And, and again, Druva Druva is a company. I I, I grew up uh, building boxes, right? And 
I remember, you know, sort of the joy that we had in, in one of my previous companies uh, where it was like, my God, the build time is down to an hour. This is amazing. This is the best day. Look at how productive we can be. And, and, and you shift to more of these infrastructure as code environments. And I can build, deploy, test in under an hour. And, and just the, 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 the productivity increase, again, if you grew up in this world, you're like, an hour? What was wrong with you back then? I'm old. Um, but but, but the, the value in this, it, it, is, it is striking how easy it is. And especially if you, you have decoupled, I can just update one container inside my cluster and, and, and everything just keeps running. So it's, it's super great. Um, the, the one I want to highlight, though, is especially what we find with our customers is disaster recovery. Now, those of you who, again, grew up in the old world like me, disaster recovery in, in data centers is brutal. Because you look, and, and, and each vendor says, well, I, I replicate the data. Again, I, I come from a storage background. Your data is over on the other side. What you're going to do with it, I don't know, but I did my part. Uh, and maybe you had you know, sort of a, your server layer. Maybe you were using Microsoft clustering or VMware clustering or you know, VMware HA or whatever it is. And, and that was your, your DR solution for compute. And then maybe your application was crash consistent or app consistent and it could spin up again. And maybe you figured out how to make your network fail over. And maybe, and maybe. And the reality is when someone said, do we have a DR plan, the goal of everyone in the room was to try to make sure that they didn't make eye contact because nobody wanted to own that because it was the worst job in the world. You shift to the cloud, you shift to this infrastructure as code, and not only does it make you more productive as a developer, but it totally transforms how you perceive disaster recovery because so much is caught up in that, that, in, that, that, that sort of definition that I don't have to worry about so many of the things I was worrying about before. And, and disaster recovery has become so much less painful than it used to be and so much easier, and so much easier to test. Um, because you can just spin up an application and try it out. So, again, for those of you out there, again, probably more on the, on the infrastructure management side than on the developer side, um, this is one of the benefits to embracing your developers as they go towards infrastructure as code. So now I want to pivot a little bit to the data part, because Richard talked earlier about all the data that you're generating just in, inside your CI CD pipeline, just inside your infrastructure's code environment, the logs, the alerts, the, you know, the, the statistics, all the data that people want to look at. But of course, one of the things that, that we look at is applications that don't have data are kind of boring. You know, there's only so much you can do with a stateless application, an ephemeral application. It sounds great, they're fun for tests, but real applications have real data. And so one of the things that we do, we spend a lot of time working with customers. You know, again, we're fully containerized in Lambda. We have a lot of customers that are moving into, say, Kubernetes environments, whether it's EKS or, or just running Kubernetes on top of EC2, however they choose to do it. And one of the discussions we have a lot is, so how are you storing data with your application? And, and, and look, there's, there's kind of three camps that we see people in all the time. And, and look, we're not here to judge, right? There's, there's totally reasons for doing all three. So, so there's one group that says, well, I actually embed the, uh, I embed the data in my container. Uh, usually this is for analytics. That way when I, when I spin up the, the container, it's got all the data with it, and I can run whatever tests I want to run. Now, that leads to like, seriously bloated containers that are very difficult to version. But we're not here to judge, but it's a terrible idea. So then, then you get to the other approaches that people use. Uh, and, and so one of which you know, people started to adopt was, I'm going to use external storage, right? Because I want my cluster to be ephemeral. I, I don't want data in the cluster. <clears throat> you know, it's all, you know, whether it's Kubernetes or ECS, I, I want this to be stateless uh, inside the cluster, so I'm going to use external data, whether that's EFS or RDS or S3 or whatever it's going to be. And, th and that tends to be uh, really nice because it keeps your cluster very lightweight. But it does also tend to lead to challenges of how do you synchronize between your application and your data because the person writing the application may not control that external data source. How do you keep those two in sync? So interesting, useful, um, definitely not judging that one. That is a very useful idea. But it does lead to challenges. And then, of course, for those of you in the Kubernetes world, you know, there's the CSI volumes, the container storage interface, where this really allows me as a developer to uh, provision applications, so EBS volumes, as it were, uh, to be able to, to you know, for, for, for my storage. Uh, and, and the nice part there is, well, now it's all under my control, you know, but the challenge, of course, is it's now in my cluster. 
So that, that beautiful stateless cluster I had that I could just spin up and down at any time and have no dependencies kind of just walked out the door because now it's got data and data is not easy to necessarily spin up and down. So you have these, these, these choices. And, and I'll tell you, at Druva, again, we don't do so much of the first one, uh, but, but, but certainly we do leverage both of the latter. Right? We will leverage the external storage with S3, but we're also, you know, we'll also leverage CSI volumes internally um, because a lot of times it just makes it easier to provision the application, migrate the application, encapsulate the application. Now the challenge you get with this, you know, no matter how you're storing your data, is you end up with a fair amount of data sprawl. Because remember, you know, we just talked about the different ways you can store data with your containers, but you know, it's not just the data with the containers. You know, like, like Richard was talking about, you've got the, the, the data that comes with your, uh, your CI CD pipeline. You've got the data that comes with tracking what's going into your ECR. You've got the data uh, of your Kubernetes cluster itself, right? Do you store that in Prometheus? Do you, do you, do you go CloudWatch? How do you, how do you manage all of these sorts of things? And of course, especially if you're bringing in old applications, how does that all fit in? Because you know, we were talking about shift, you know, sort of going to that, how do I modernize these applications and, and, and move them uh, in, into, the, into kind of a new world? And so you have a real challenge here of, I've got data everywhere. How are you gonna manage that? Because if you don't go in with the plan, what you're gonna end up with is, data in a million different locations. And going back to, to where we were talking, who's got control of it? Who's got access to it? And, and, and uh, frankly, who can, who can make copies of it? Um, I, I don't know, Richard, if, if, if in the environments you see how, how people sort of approach just trying to wrap their arms around all the stuff that comes around this, 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 this world that they're creating. Yeah, so we often um, we call those data islands where you have um, bits of data throughout the uh, entire infrastructure. Um, it does remind me of this comic of, there's these uh, five blind men with an elephant, and each of them has uh, you know, access to just a part, the trunk or the tail or the, the leg, and because they have a very narrow view of it, they, they have a distorted perception of what they're interacting with. So one thinks it's a tree, another one thinks it's a vine, another one thinks it's a snake, uh, and it's only until you, you, know, you put all that data together do you get an actual accurate representation of what's going on. Um, which is a, a huge benefit to putting everything in one place, but it comes with that, that trade-off of, okay, now we have our data in one place, how, how do we control access to that? Who, who do we give access to that? So we have services that allow you to give uh, you know, column-level access. Um, DynamoDB offers this, um, where you can say, you know, someone can read from this table, but only these columns or only these keys, um, and then you can add you know, fine-grained IAM permissions on top of that to, to really make that much more granular. And what I would tell everybody in the audience, and again, this is, this is certainly inside of Druva, where we've probably had, again, the greatest tension between the development team and the cloud operations team, is the development team looks and says, again, I want my data, I want to set up, I want to do what I want, when I want, because I've got deadlines, right? I've got to deliver a feature X, Y, and Z in the next two weeks. I've got, a, I've got urgent customer demands. And the cloud operations team says, we get that. But we've also got to get, you know, we've got to get control of this because we have FedRAMP certification and we've got, uh, you know, SOC 2 certification and we've got, you know, ISO 27001. We've got all, and, and we can't just go to the auditors and say, our data is places uh, and access is people. Uh, you know, you've got to get control over that. And so, uh, especially a couple of years ago, again, it led to, to sort of the fights between, between the two groups and it led to, uh, frankly, a lot of the development team saying, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do my over th thing over here. I'm not going to tell you about it, um, which is not productive. And so you know, one of the best practices that we found uh, internally, certainly, was to say, look, you know, again, we're not here to get in your way. However you want to build your application, however you want to store your data, we get it. But you know, we've got, you know, we, we've got a, a, a handful of sort of centralized mechanisms you are supposed to, you know, this data goes in Dynamo, <clears throat> this data goes in S3, you know, how, you can make your own bucket, you can do what you want, but you also have to notify us to what you're doing. Um, now, one of the nice things over the last couple of years, and I think we'll talk about this in a couple minutes, but one of the nice things over the last couple of years is AWS is also adding a lot more tools that makes it easier to discover. 
so that, so that uh, you know, trust but verify. I totally believe that you're telling me everything you're using, but I'm also going to be watching you. Uh, and and, that, and we'll, we'll get into some of that. Um, so, so the other thing, and the reason this becomes so important, and, and, and again, if you're on the development side, you're like, sure, certifications, those are important. You have to get, you know, but come on, really? How, how hard is that? How Auditors, we can, we can get past them. By the way, you can't just get past auditors, but uh, good idea. Um, but the other thing is the cyber threats. You know, the more places you have data, you know, the more angles for, for invasion. Uh, and in fact, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, again, we're a data protection company, so a lot of our customers uh, are very, very worried about ransomware. In fact, that's the number one thing that they're, they're sort of looking at today is how do I protect against ransomware? And, 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 we, and we walk them through you know, sort of the best practices. Uh, and, and we say, look, the, f the first step here is obviously you know, the first thing ransomware attackers are trying to do today <clears throat> is to basically get rid of your backups. Because if I encrypt your data after I've gotten rid of the backups, you have no choice but to, to pay the ransom. So they'll go after the backups first. So we always tell them, get your backups off-site, separate locations, separately managed, can't be compromised in any way. And ideally, do that automatically so that it's not your responsibility. Then the second step, of course, is you're going to need to be able to recover because if you have a good copy off-site, but you realize it's going to take you four weeks to bring it back, you're still going to end up paying the ransom. So you have to have a very clean process about how you can rapidly recover. And this is often where cloud is super useful, right? Because you can scale up to, to whatever you need. But then the third part that really comes into this is you need something to operationalize it. Because the odds of you as an operations team being able to keep track of every security patch, to be able to keep track of every you know, sort of application update, everything that's happening in the environment, watching all the network configurations, watching all of that on your own at scale is pretty close to zero. So you're going to have to, almost to Richard's point, you know, <laughs> you've got more than 50 of them, you're going to have to automate this. You're going to have to look to tools to help you, you know, sort of get control. And it's really, really critical in a developer environment because most of the customers that I talk to that have been compromised by ransomware, it has not been the prod environment that was initially compromised. Because usually everybody's got multiple layers of security and, and, and all sorts of things uh, around the prod environment that, that keeps bad stuff from getting in, right? You know, you're, even your administrators can't log directly in. You've got a bastion you know, sort of gating access. You have all this wonderful stuff. The developer environment, not so much. But the reality is once ransomware gets into your environment, even if it gets in through the dev environment, once you're inside, it's a whole lot easier to spread not just to other dev environments, but also to prod because you tend to have stronger walls prod outside than you do prod compared to your developers. And so you've got to look at not just the prod environment, but you have to look at the entire thing end to end. So make sure that you're protected. Make sure it's automatic. Make sure you've got a recovery plan. Make sure the operations are taken care of in an automated way so you're not trying to do this by hand. But make sure you get that whole environment. If part of your pipeline is exposed, all of your pipeline ends up getting exposed. We've seen this over and over and over again. And while I'm, I'm thrilled to help people recover, I'd be much happier if they didn't have to. And so then that leads us really to the, to the last part is, is, is so, so how do you manage this? Um, and so again, protect your apps and your infrastructure. You know, look to, again, look beyond the infrastructure boundaries. You know, and then finally, again, enable your developers to be productive so they don't go rogue on you, but you've got to keep that central oversight. <clears throat> and on that third point, I wanted to talk about something that, that you know, I think Richard and I both believe strongly in. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll start it out with, I love multiple accounts. How do you feel about accounts? Um, I, I also like multiple accounts. Um, I had once made a joke that um, if I could have a new account for every deployment, like that would be my, uh, my Christmas gift this year. Um, the, the AWS accounts team was not as amused with that as I thought it would be. Um, but yeah, inside Amazon, we also love multiple accounts. We have 200 plus publicly available AWS services, and those are backed by thousands of smaller services kind of behind the scenes. And anytime a team creates a new service or they're planning on creating a new service, they start with six or seven accounts by default. And uh, Claire Ligori, one of our uh, principal engineers, wrote a, uh, an Amazon Builders Library article about how we do these deployments. And if you read between lines a little bit, you'll see that those are all in separate accounts. So you have a, an alpha, beta, gamma stage for like pre-production for testing. And then you've got um, you know, prod one, prod two, prod three. 
until all of your proud regions, and each stage is an account, and then inside of each stage, each individual region that we deploy to is a separate account. Um, and the reason we start with this, you know, you have many accounts, and then uh, you know, you can grow from there, is that going from five accounts to six is much simpler than going from one account to two. Is that that first uh, change you have to make to get into like multiple accounts because there's things that you will hard code that you don't realize are an issue until you try to do that split. So, so we love multiple accounts, but the downside to using multiple accounts is you need a way to manage those. Um, and this comes back to the, you know, I guess six is a convenient number because I said less than five or more than 50. And we start you uh, on the side of five so that you have to automate it. You have to, you know, you'll end up with more than 50. Um, and, you know, things like, uh, things like Control Tower help you manage these accounts as you create them and automatically provision infrastructure in them. And one of the things that, that I, and again, at, at Druva, again, we're, we're on the, the, the exact same sort of approach, right? You know, multiple, tons of accounts, developers keep them isolated in accounts. And again, one of our, one of our main reason, you know, purposes behind this is, is frankly to, to limit blast zones, right? So, so again, our assumption is always that when you get enough people in an environment, someone will do something that they wish they hadn't done. Or more importantly, someone will do something that I wish they hadn't done. And, and being able to keep them isolated tends to limit the amount of damage they do to the organization and to, every, to everything else around them. Um, and, and, and it's just part of sort of the culture saying, well, you should, you should have separate accounts. Now, now I know, Richard, you, you, you've dealt with people that have just these, this one big massive account. Uh, is it just sort of fear of having multiple accounts? What's the, what, what, what keeps people from, from going multiple accounts? There's a, there's a few approaches. To, um, Issue, um, things that lead people into this. So one is um, ending up in a single account is a very natural extension of how people get started on AWS. Right? You you sign up with like the, the CTO's credit card that shares the same account he uses for Amazon.com, uh, and uh, you have this this one account, and you give someone a, you know an IAM user in there some credentials that they have on their machine, and they deploy a prototype. And Stephen says, "I love it. Put it in production," um, and then it's in production. We add some new feature. Uh, you know, added to the same account. You know, it's maybe a, an extra method that's in the Lambda function that's in there. Um, and over time, that feature grows and it grows. And they say, well, let's split this out into a new service. And people say, okay, well, let's, you know, let's split it out. And the first thought is like, well, we have this one account. Let's just split it into another Lambda function in this account. So now you have two functions that are talking to each other. You don't have to deal with cross-account IAM permissions. Um, it's, yeah. it's all in one place. Um, and you don't r really think about, well, maybe I should have more accounts until you're at 700 Lambda functions, and we're like, well, maybe we should put it in a new account. And nobody wants to be that team where 699 other teams all get to be in the main account, and then you're at the kids' table, like, off in the other account. Um, so like, no, why should I have to move? Like, make someone else move. Um, and that's where it gets challenging, because then you find all of these things that you hadn't thought about that were dependent on that specific account, where you say, well, okay, I'll, I'll use the SAM CLI or something, I'll put my Lambda function in some other account, it's like, oh, I don't have IAM permissions, so you need IAM permissions. It's, oh, I'm not in the same VPC, so then you set a VPC configuration. And all these things that you just took for granted for being in that same account, you now have to you know, think about and reason about, and that's a, you know, a resource tax that you have to pay for that first move to another account. And I always say that like, data has gravity. Like where your data is, people will put things that need that data, and because that's where all the things are and the data is, more things show up there. So that's like one of the main reasons I see customers ending up in like a single account architecture. Got it. And, 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 and again, we, we get it, right? But, but you really want to get out of that. And, and you know, the other reason I hear from customers is I don't know how I'm going to manage all those accounts. And again, you know, I, I don't work for AWS, but I will tell you Control Tower really makes your life a lot easier for that, finding policies, managing across them. And, and certainly as, as Druva, from our data protection perspective, it's really great for us because, frankly, it enables us to help discover you know, all, all that you've got running in your environment, and then we can discover the resources running inside it so we can protect it for you. Do that protection, whether it's for compliance or for ransomware protection or whatever it's going to be. So, so the more that you get multi-account, the more tooling is going to be there for you. This is the way the world is heading. Right? This, is, this is not one of those, in, in my mind, where there's a debate between, no, one account versus multiple accounts. It's just, when are you going to get to multiple accounts and how long do you want to wait before you get there? So, so, so I want to finish then with, with sort of letting, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll each do one sort of blue sky again. What's, what's coming in the next couple of years? I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one and I'll let Richard have sort of the closing word. So, 
so, so for me, uh, and again, I admit that I, I come from a data-centric world, and like, like Richard said, data has gravity. One of the biggest challenges I see our customers having, one of the biggest challenges we have, uh, is I can clone an environment very easily. Uh, but when I want to run a test, if I'm running data protection tests, I need data. And I want real data. I want database data. I want VM data. I don't just want sort of a bunch of randomly generated uh, you know, zeros and ones. I want legitimate data, because that's how I test whether my stuff works or not. Uh, and synthetically generating data takes my test from taking you know, a few minutes to suddenly taking days, because I've got to synthetically generate enough data to be interesting. Well, that's not fun. And synthetically generated data is not even that good. Uh, so, so a lot of what we're looking at now is how do you get to, if you got infrastructure as code, how do I get to data as code? Where I can take basically versions of data and clone them off just the way I do my infrastructure. So I can get the entire thing cloned all as one. And we really see this coming, not just for, for, for sort of test environments, development environments, but also our AI ML teams are looking at the same thing. I'd love to be able to, to sort of archive this this data set with this model, so that if six months later I'm getting sued and I need to reproduce how I got to this conclusion, I can do it. Or if I want to test new data on the old model, see exactly what that behaves like. Or even running the old data on a new model to make sure I don't get regressions. Uh, so so as, as you advance, again, data has gravity, but that doesn't mean it needs to hold you back. And you're going to be able to start to view data again almost that same way. You can check in you know, versions of data, tag versions of data, check them out and get them anywhere in the world you're gonna to wanna to get them because the cloud's gonna enable that kind of connectivity. So, so that's our prediction for the next two or three years is you're gonna see infrastructure as a code evolve to also include data as code. Yep, and I agree with that. Um, I feel back to didn't mention this in our dry run um, I hadn't thought of it until last night, is that with the CloudFormation resource provider framework where you can define these resources that are not just AWS resources but on-prem resources or third-party resources, you could create a CloudFormation resource that is uh, test data that will check out data from some place and all that's managed on behalf of the developer. So they'll deploy a CloudFormation template and just get data in their account and you have this you know, kind of common framework that's used to check it out. It notifies the appropriate security teams that this data is used in this place for these reasons. Re for the, yeah in these regions for these reasons. Um, and then when they you know, update the template or they delete the template, it can also notify that, okay, they are no longer using this and it handles all that for them. So I think we're, we're getting to the future. I think we're much closer to the future than we think we are, but um, there are capabilities in our infrastructure as code tools that I think we can leverage to um, start this uh, data as code approach. I'm sure there's gonna be rough edges because data isn't uh, you know, infrastructure, so it might be a, a little wonky at first, but uh, yeah, I think we're, we're really close. That's cool. cool. So, so with that, uh, I, I will say again, you know, uh, for those of you who are looking for anything in the data protection space, if you're looking to protect yourself, uh, you have SaaS apps, public cloud, data centers, edge, if you're worried about protection, cyber resiliency, governance, you know, getting intelligence from your data, please come talk to us. Uh, we, we, we would love to have a conversation. We are, again, built on top of AWS. We're cloud native. We are, we're here to help either with your protection challenges, or again, if you just want to talk about how we've built what we've built uh, and some of the, uh, the lessons we've learned, both good and bad, we're, we're happy to always talk. Um, uh, because ultimately, look, you know, if you're a developer, you, know, you, you don't want to be starting from scratch, right? You need tools and you need data. Uh, if you're an infrastructure person, you need to make sure that data is secure. Because if it's not secure, you're going to have a lot of pain. And you know, is, as, as quickly as it feels like infrastructure as code is coming at you, like Richard said, data as code is not behind. So it's time to, to start jumping on, jumping on this wagon and, and always getting yourself set up. Uh, and, and that means, again, getting control of where's the data in your environment? How are you protecting that data? And of course, you know, not to, to beat a dead horse, but you know, multiple accounts, multiple accounts, multiple accounts goes along with security, security, security. Uh, and so, you know, with that, again, if you've got any questions, we're at booth 1341. Uh, we're on the marketplace, and hey, if you just want to take it for a test drive, we're a SaaS app. It's easy just to download us, uh, get a 30-day free trial. Not 31, it's 30 days. But uh, for that 30 days, you can, you can enjoy uh, every, every moment of it. Uh, and so with that, again, Richard, I, I thank you for your time. I thank all of you in the audience for your time. And of course, uh, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to take them. Otherwise, have an awesome day and have a great, uh, great time out there.